Praise God. When we uh, started the service, we uh, had lit the, um, the luminaries, uh, but it was getting windier and windier as time rolled along. For a season there, it was like almost still, and we wouldn't have had much problem with that. But the wind has blown some out. We're not going to worry about it. Uh, but there were still quite a few. My point is there were still quite a few that were still lit. Now, that's not going to mean anything in the daylight, you know, for people driving past or anything like that. If they see the bags, they know these are luminaries. They know that that's what it's about. And they know that that has to do with a time of worship. So even if they don't stay lit, they still speak of God and of Jesus. Okay? But there were quite a few still lit when we came in. Uh, and so we don't know what will happen as things, if they get, it gets windier or not, maybe some will go ahead and go the distance. But I just mentioned that to you so you, will, so you know. All right, so it's match, Matthew 26, and look at verse 36, okay? This is where the uh, Gospel of Matthew mentions about Gethsemane. Gethsemane, okay? The, uh, the garden. That they, had, that they went to in order to pray. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. So you guys stay here. I'm going to go over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, by the way, now those are the same two that came with their mother and asked Jesus, can we sit on one side and the, and the other on the other side? And, and Jesus didn't say, no way. He just said, it's not up to me. It's whatever the Father says, but you're welcome to get as close to me as you want to. Okay, that's the key. That's what the whole thing was all about. All right, and Jesus asked them, you know, are you able? Are you able to do, are you able to go through everything I'm going to go through? Are you able to go through the suffering? Are you able to go through the death? Are you able to go through the resurrection? And they said, we are able. And he didn't say, no, you're not. No, he just told them, it's, it's serious stuff. It's serious stuff. And if you're able, then that we're going to start down the road, so to speak. Okay, so he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Watch with me. The word watch from the word of watch from the Greek. Uh, has to do with arising, refraining from sleep, keeping awake, paying attention, you know, to what's going on, to the revelation that's about to be revealed, to be mindful about what is going on, to take it seriously, to recognize there's a danger if you don't, but not, not entering into a fretting and a worry. That's the word watch. Watch with me. It's the opposite of sleep and neglect, okay? And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup. You see what he's, you, you got to know what he's thinking about when he tells James and John, can you drink the cup? He knows what he's talking about. Let this cup pass from me. Who wouldn't want that? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And that's the word we saw repeatedly throughout the last couple of weeks. You know, people are, do you will to do this? Do you will to be this? Okay? And Jesus is doing the same thing. It's not what I want, God. It's not what I want, Father. It's what you say. And he cometh unto the disciples, and he findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, what? What? I mean, are you, I mean, basically this word is referring to asking them another question. Are you utterly unable? 
Are you utterly unable? What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The Spirit, and Jesus knows this, the Spirit indeed is willing. See, there's the willing again. But the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and he went away again and prayed the third time. You know, there are at least a couple of numbers, well, there's more than a couple, in the Jewish mindset that talk about fullness and completion and so forth. Three is one of them, okay? Seven is another one. Ten is another one. Twelve is another one. There's numerous ones, actually. Prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, saith unto them, Sleep on now. Go ahead. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. See? Remember that's what the word watch refers to? You know, I'm gonna fall down and start snoring, okay? Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. It's not that Jesus is gonna to try to run away. It's not flight, as some people would probably suspect or would like to believe that he's gonna run away from the situation. No, he's actually hurrying to meet with them. I'm talking about Judas and the people he brought to arrest Jesus. He's not trying to run away. You know, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that does betray us. He's not trying to get away from them. He's going to meet the whole thing head on. Okay? And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign. Judas did, that is. Gave him a sign. Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. I think we probably all understand that uh, the reason they set up this sign to be able to tell what's going on is because there would have been lots of commotion. There would have been lots of voices and perhaps yelling and screaming and hollering at somebody or telling people to get out of the way or, you know, just a lot of noise, a lot of racket, a lot of confusion. Not only that, it was dark. And yeah, they would have had their... their torches and their lanterns and you know and things like this but you know at night what that's like it's just a lot of shadows and so forth and uh, they're just they, they wanted to be sure about it whoever I kiss that same is he hold him fast the Greek word for kiss here is phileo it's the same word used in you know, many, many other places throughout the scriptures. But phileo is a, uh, to, be, to be loved, to be dear, to be a, to be a friend, to have affection. It's a, it's a human type of love. Agape, of course, is talking about God's type of love, okay? But this phileo, well, you see what we did here in Pennsylvania. We got a city over on the other end of the state. It's called the city of brotherly love. And what is it? Philadelphia. Delphia is brother. Phila is love. Uh, but so love of the brother. Uh, and that's where that all comes from. So this kiss is, uh, is that affectionate, um, in a sense, worldly um, uh, reference. Hold him. Hold on to him. 
Let's not let him go. Forthwith he came to Jesus and he said, Hail, Master. Oh, I will tell you that this master is not the Hebrew word uh, Rabboni that we talked about before. Bartimaeus and Mary Magdalene are the only two people reported in the scripture to have used that word. It doesn't mean somebody else didn't use it somewhere along the line, but it wasn't here. Okay, this isn't Rabboni. This master is Rob, or you can almost say Rab. It's R-A-B, like from Rabbi, only it's the short version. But it's probably pronounced more like Rob. Well, that's, you know, hail, Rob, hail, master. But it's not a personal, very strong word, you know. Like Rabboni was my great teacher, my great master, personal. Okay? And then he kissed him. And then he kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou, art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus, and they took him. Probably not being any too gentle with him either. Probably grabbing him, probably pulling him, probably making him trip. Maybe he falls to the ground. I, you know. I don't know. I'm sure they weren't trying to be real careful with them. But let's not misunderstand the word friend. This is not the usual word for friend. This is, um, this is the word uh, heteris. And it literally refers to, if it's female, it's one thing. If it's male, it's another. If it's a male, and of course this was between Judas and Jesus, uh, a companion, a uh, uh, to the chief. That's what it's the, to be a companion to the chief, but not for the purpose of helping him, but rather for the purpose of getting what you can get out of it. That's a very negative picture, people. So this is not Jesus going, hey, buddy, put his arm around him, slap him on the shoulder. Hi, friend. No, it's not that. It's not that at all. All right, you might as well understand these things. This is a serious time. They laid hands on Jesus and they took him. And behold, one of them which were with uh, Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword. Another gospel makes clear this is Peter. Gets out his sword out of its sheath and, and takes a whack at the servant of the high priest. His name was Malchus, we find out in another gospel. And, and it turns out it smote, he smote off his ear. Now, I read in a commentary one time that he probably wasn't shooting for the ear. <laughs> okay? He probably wasn't, you know, trying to get his ear. He'd probably try and take his head off. And I can, you can understand why you do that. It's not just, I'm going to nick him. You know, no. He's, he's, this, what I'm saying is, it, it's probably not just a little bit of a, of a cut. Uh, he ended up just hitting the ear, but it may have been much bigger than that. Uh, the, the, his, this Peter, his Jesus was being taken. It was serious business. He knew that he was probably not going to make it out of this thing alive. And so he tries to hurt this Malchus. <laughs> and maybe more. Anyway, then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? You don't think I could find some place to get some help here? You know? You think you have to take care of it all by yourself, Peter? You think you need to go on your own direction and your own plan? Is that really what you think, Peter? But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled? <laughs> hey, let me tell you. I'm telling, this, I'm telling you this is crucial. How shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Unless it happens like the scripture says. Okay? And that, by the way, I will be showing you. <laughs> okay? How then shall, this, shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be, 
It's got to be the way the scripture says it's going to be. And in that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, okay, to the whole group. I mean, somebody suggested there was probably over 400 people in that garden that night. Because one scripture says that there was a cohort. And a cohort is hundreds. I mean, cohort, like in the military sense, is hundreds. So probably, probably at least 400 people in that garden. You imagine the confusion. Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I mean, come on. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures, watch, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Um, <clears throat> we, we have this picture of this journey and all the way through ever since Christmas we've been it's, it's an orderly kind of thing Jesus wants to go here so they go there and they're following him and they're you know in his footsteps you know uh, and that's what it sounds like you know one foot in front of the other step by step and it's the way it was for most of the time but all of a sudden he's taken captive, hostage, if you will, and arrested and so forth. And all the disciples forsook him and fled. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I think of somebody following somebody on a trail, you follow them on the trail. You don't try to get around them. You don't try to go this way or that way or down the hill or up the hill or anything like that. You're following somebody, okay? And all of a sudden, they're not following any, him anymore. Now, they take off on their own. So instead of an orderly step-by-step, step, right? You know, step-by-step, step, one foot in front of the other, it's, it's, a, it's a mad exodus. It's a, it's, it, it's a lot, there's a lot of scampering. There's a lot of this one that way, this one that way, this one's going over there, just hightailing it running out of there. And you can understand it. That, I mean, that's in the human sense, that's what it would be like. Here, the one who's always led you is now being led away. <laughs> you know, taken captive. And how are you going to follow that? There are many, many steps throughout this time period from uh, you know, in, these la in this last week, let's say, of like what we call Holy Week, okay? Uh, and so you get your Palm Sunday, and then there's a whole bunch of things that happened after that. Things like uh, Jesus making it clear that Peter was going to deny him. And lo and behold, guess what happens? He denies him. You know, the rooster crows, and Peter knows that he, you know, falls into this prophecy, and he, you know, weeps bitterly, we're told, and later comes back to Jesus and is, I believe, fully repentant. And, and in that, received back, brought back into the fold, so to speak. Uh, and and all, that's just one thing. What about um, Judas and everything that he did? You know, betraying, getting the money, Deciding that it didn't, it wasn't going quite the way he expected it to, so he was going to give him back the money. You know, now I want to tell you, the Bible doesn't say that's repentance. <laughs> you know, he was remorseful. That's the best you can put it. That's the best you can say it. Repentance means you have a complete change of heart and a change of direction, and that's not what Judas was doing. And you can tell that because when he tried to give the money back. They didn't receive it, so he throws it at them, you know, and then runs off and commits suicide. That's not repentance. Okay? It's remorse. You, you know, wish it had gone a different way, but it didn't. And then there's Pontius Pilate. And before that, there's Caiaphas, there's Annas, and then Pontius Pilate, and then Herod, and then Pontius Pilate again. And this is all night long. All night long. 
It's just, it's one thing after the other. It's step by step. Well, I don't want to forget something to make it clear the, how the night began. This is how the night proceeded, but I want you to, sh I want to show you first. Before we go further with that, I'm going to take a few steps back and I'm going to show you a, um, you know, how the night began. So go back to Matthew chapter 26, okay? And uh, by the way, I'm not forgetting something here. I have this plan. <laughs> Just listen. I have this plan. Matthew 26, okay? And we'll look at verse 26, okay? So they're up in this upper room, and uh, Jesus makes it clear that he's going to be, you know, betrayed. He says that in verse 21. And then, you know, is it me, is it me, is it me, you know. And uh, whoever dips his bread in the, in the bowl with me, that's the one that's going to betray me. He turned out to be Judas. And as they were eating, verse 26 says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Remission talks about a standing against sin. I've told you that many times before. Remission. Uh, it's, it, it is a matter of forgiveness, but modern forgiveness, that's not what this is. <laughs> I mean, what you think of when people talk about forgiveness nowadays, this is not the same thing. This is a standing against sin, okay? And if you're truly looking to, for somebody to forgive you, you will stand against that sin. And you will not only claim to never do it again, but you won't do it again. All right. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, all right, when they had sung a hymn, which by the way, it's, it's uh, three chapters of Psalms. It's chapter uh, 15, that's maybe four, 15, 16, 17, 18, I think it's four chapters of Psalms, okay? So it's a lengthy psalm. <laughs> Okay, a lengthy song. And it's called the Hillel. And they sang that. They went out into the Mount of Olives. That's, of course, you know, uh, where Jesus prays in the first place. And then they go on to, you know, to the other things after that. But anyway, you get the drift. Let's see. Let me go a little, no, that's as far as I want to go right now. Okay? We got to see how the, how the night began. It's one thing to see how it ended. It's one, it's one thing to see how it progressed. But you need to see how it began. Because it began with Jesus leading the way. All right? Leading the way. Don't forget how the night began. And, of course, there were other things back in this early stage. While they're still there, you know, they celebrate the Passover. And they celebrate the what be, has become known as the Lord's Supper uh, or uh, communion. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as, well, that's how this all began. But don't forget how the night ended either. Both are very, very important. I want to suggest another title for the rest of this service. Step by step, step by step, without even hitting the ground, without even hitting or touching the ground. And even surely beyond that. Let me show you what I'm talking about, all right? Turn to Matthew chapter 27, okay? 
Matthew chapter 27. All right? <clears throat> Look at verse 32. Matthew 27, verse 32. Now, what's happened here, of course, is, you know, we talked about Peter's denial, we talked about the death of Judas, we talked about Pilate, I also mentioned Herod and the, and the second uh, trial before uh, Pilate and, uh, and so forth. So all of this is, has taken place, and obviously we don't have time to go over the details of all of it, but through the years we have done that. I mean, this year, this year, this year. We've covered it all, you know, basically. So I'm not worried about that. I just think it's important to put this thing together so that it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey from beginning to end. Amen? And it's even before Christmas. I keep saying Christmas is the beginning. It's before Christmas. There is prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament that makes it clear that Jesus is the fulfillment. Amen? He is who he says he is. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, verse 32, are you there? This is Matthew 27. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 32. And as they came out, came out of the city, they found a man uh, of Cyrene, it says here, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. Interesting backstory to all of that. Simon had a couple of kids, and they are mentioned in the scriptures, okay? And it's believed by a lot of commentators that it's, it kind of reveals and shows that Simon became a Christian. And of course, this carrying of the cross would be a big step, you know, towards that. So, because, I, the reason I say it is because his two children were, were prominent, were very active in the life of the church. In years to come so it's very possible that he was right with them so to speak and when they were coming to a place called Golgotha that is to say a place of a skull some people wonder maybe if it wasn't that there were skulls laying around the ground because this is where they did execute a lot of people through the years but I'm not so sure that's the case because you know they would have it was a very um, wrong thing in their minds to let somebody go past sundown without being buried. So to have skeletons and, and skulls and stuff laying around all over the place is kind of doubtful. All right. But it, it has been suggested that there was a rock, not a rock formation, maybe a ground formation. Okay. This, at that place, to have a, a big hump in the ground and it had these cave-like areas where you could say well those are the eyes or and here's the the you know where you take the flesh off and you have a hole in the skull for the nose or for the mouth or whatever i don't know how extensive this thing was but it's quite likely that it, it just kind of looked like a skull okay kind of looked like a skull all right uh Golgotha. It's an Aramaic word, but it uh, probably is referring to what this place looked like, not so much how many skulls you could find on the ground. I just kind of doubt that. Anyway, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, you know, just let it touch his tongue, I guess, uh, he would not drink. Now, you're going to see several things in these next few minutes that God knew was going to happen, and the Bible says so. <laughs> you know, and then they happen. You know what that is? That's prophecy fulfilled. Okay? Prophecy fulfilled. There are places in the scriptures where it talks about not drinking while he's on this cross. And then it says they crucified him, and they parted his garments, and they cast lots for them. They gambled for them. Okay? And especially the cloak, because the cloak was believed to be, you know, <clears throat> it was it was just it was one piece from edge of the coat to the other, all the way around the body, and there was no seam, you know, no place where it was put back together again. And so they didn't want to just rip it up and 
turned them into camel washing cloths, you know. They want, you know, they wanted to go ahead and uh, have it be useful. So they cast lots, okay, they cast lots. That it might be, watch this, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. That's a prophecy from the Old Testament, Psalms 22. And now it's being fulfilled. You see, the point is that God knew all this stuff ahead of time. Amen? Now they're watching it happen. Praise God. Psalm 22, that's where that is. And sitting down, they watched him there. Okay? So, uh, one commentary suggested that it might be because they were kind of worried that somebody was going to um, mount a, a rescue mission, you know, to go ahead and uh, charge at the cross and, and get him down before the soldiers could do anything about it and, and thereby save his life. That's not what, uh, you know, what Jesus wanted to happen or what God wanted to have happen. But there, it is true that they, that they watched for a while. All right, Let's see what's going on. And they set up over his head this accusation. It says, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And this is a uh, probably a board, all right? Probably a board. One commentary suggests that it was hung by a rope or a chain, and they put it up over his head, and, uh, and I mean, there's hundreds of other people that were crucified. So who knows who had it, which way, who knows? But anyway, to put, and then hang over his chest, that this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Got a similar thing right here, right where you see the crown of thorns. Now I made that many, many, many years ago, all right? It's got that Jesus was the King of the Jews on there, okay? In three different languages, all right? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, all right? Uh, <clears throat> and one is a, is a version, the Hebrew is sometimes connected to the what's called the Aramaic. That's believed that when Jesus was on this earth having his ministry, he spoke Aramaic, okay? I don't wanna really need to go further than that with that, but anyway, there, that's, it looks something like that. It was probably a plaque of some sort, okay? And, uh, the uh, religious leaders, well, let me just tell you, they had a fit. They didn't want that there. And they didn't want it to say that. They said, you can't say that he is the king of the Jews. You have to change that. And you have to say that he said he was king of the Jews. Okay? And uh, Pilate, <laughs> having been one to really not stand up for the truth too much <laughs> in the uh, previous episodes of this whole thing, comes down to the point where he, you know, he does take a stand here on this particular issue. He said, what is written, what I have written is written. That's it. That's what it's going to say. I don't want to hear another word about it. That's what he said, basically. All right? He is the king. Not just that he said he was, he is. And then there were two thieves. Yeah, you heard about them. They were crucified, one on one side and one on the other. One on the right hand, it says, and another on the left. And then if you jump ahead to verse 44 for just a minute, it says clearly the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. In other words, they were throwing insults and, and challenges at him and so forth, right in his teeth. You know, it's just saying right in his face. You know, Jesus, you know, and he's blasting him with this stuff. Both thieves did that. That's what it says, okay? But after a while, one knocked it off. And the other one, and that one tried to stop the other one. He said, hey, listen. We deserve what we're getting. We have either murdered or we have 
been a part of an insurrection, uh, an uprising within the city to get rid of the Romans and so forth, or we have been thieves, we have stolen, probably they did it all, okay? Multi-purpose, bad guys, okay? And the, but the one thief says to the other, he says, we deserve what we're getting because we did do this stuff. But he didn't. In fact, he says, this guy didn't do anything wrong. And he turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, and there you go. <laughs> okay? He mentions Jesus anymore. He's Lord. All right? Lord, ruler of my life. Lord. He doesn't have one more minute hardly to be a good guy. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the next year and a half to show that he can shape up. He doesn't have any of that. He's probably going to be dead in a matter of minutes or maybe a couple hours. I don't know how long it really took. All right? And, and he said, he said that he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. When you come into your kingdom. He, he, he didn't say, can I get a guarantee on that? Can I get that in writing? You know, I don't know how Jesus is going to write this thing out, but, you know, can I get this in writing? Can I, you know, you know, can I have a contract? No, he didn't say that. He just says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. I'm not talking about his body. I'm not talking about his clothes. Or he didn't probably have anything on at the time, come to think of it. But, you know, he's not talking about that. He's, he's saying, you know, his spirit, his heart, his soul, his, his inwardness, that's going to be in paradise with Jesus. Praise God. And they that passed by, lots of people did, by the way, because remember, this was Passover, and there were probably hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem, and everybody's passing, and this is right outside the gate of Jerusalem, so people are passing by constantly, traffic everywhere, and there's no cars and no buses or anything, so it's just, you know, them walking, and everybody is seeing this happen. Everybody sees it, and they pass by, and they reviled him, they reviled Jesus, and they wagged their heads, and they said, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Now that was part of a discussion that he had with somebody else. He was talking about his own body. He was talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was talking about his flesh, okay? going to go ahead and, and suffer and die, and in three days it's going to be raised up again. And right away they think he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Or they say they think that's what he's talking about. I'm not so sure you could be that stupid. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure you could be that stupid. It took 56 years to raise up that temple in the first place. And no way is anybody going to do it, even especially by himself and without a work crew. How are you going to do that in three days? So the guys are saying, you know, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. Now watch. If thou be the son of God. If you are the son of, what do you mean, if? God already said he was the son of God. The angel came to Mary and said, that holy thing in you is going to be called the son of God. It's already a done deal, people. You can't go tearing up the past and make a change. If thou be the son of God, come down from that cross. And I think I want to suggest to you that that's a satanic statement. I believe that comes from demon possession. I believe these people are saying what Satan would like to say to everybody. Come on, Jesus, come down from the cross. Because if you come down from the cross, 
you can't save anybody. If you're not going to die for people's sin, then you can't save anybody. And, I, and there's several people right in a row here that, you know, come on, Jesus. Come on down. Come on down, please. You know, come on down. Yeah. It's not so we can follow you. It's not so we can honestly believe in you. One guy says, yeah, we'll believe in you. Yeah, baloney. No, this is trying to get him to stop accomplishing what he's about to accomplish. Also the chief priest, it says in verse 41, likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders. They said he saved others. You know, himself he cannot save. Who does this guy think he is? He saved others. Sozo is a Greek word here for saved. It means to deliver, to protect, okay? To make whole again. He saved others himself. He cannot save. Now watch, watch what he says. And if he be the king, all right? We talked about him being the son of God. Now, what if he, if he is king? See, if he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And we will believe in him. Can I just say lunch meat again? I mean, come on. This is not going to happen. They're not going to believe in him if he comes down from the cross. Satan wants to stop Jesus from accomplishing what he's trying to accomplish. All right, verse 43, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now. Now watch, if he will have him, see, casting aspersions on the relationship that God the Father has with his son, Jesus. You know, if he will have them. Look at all the ifs. Lots of them. The further away you get from God, the more ifs you're going to hold on to. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. <laughs> well, he is the son of God. That's why he said he was the son of God. God even said he was the son of God. When Jesus stood in the water of the Jordan River and God spoke from heaven, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You better listen to him. Amen. There was God up in heaven and a man standing down in the water which God says is his son. Now, if he's not his son, then God's a big fat liar. Well, you know where that's gonna go. <coughs> Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And then lastly, and I already mentioned this about the thieves, it says in verse 44, which were crucified <coughs> with him, cast the same in his teeth, threw it right in his face, okay? But praise God, one of them changed. One of them went God's way, all right? And, and who knows? Maybe in the end, the other guy did too. I don't know. It doesn't say. I mean, you'd like to think he did. I mean, look at the witness he had from his buddy, you know, from his friend. But you can't say that he did. It doesn't say so in the scripture. And you can't go beyond scripture. Okay? Praise God. Now we're not done yet. Not quite. Almost. But not quite. Alright? If you want to watch where I'm at, you've got your Bibles. It's chapter 27, beginning with the 45th verse. Because the story's not over yet. Okay? 45. You ready? Now from the 6th hour... There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. <laughs> it's funny, you know, in another week or two here, in another week, I guess, they're gonna have a, there's going to be a big solar eclipse or something. And uh, anyway, some have suggested that this was a solar eclipse. <laughs> oh, gosh. You can come up with all the stuff you want, but it's not going to make it true. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, 
That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to point out that he's quoting his ancestor David. <laughs> okay? God said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So I don't, you know, I'm not saying David didn't feel forsaken. Okay? And I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't feel separated from God in all of this. Imagine what they're all they're doing to him and all the ways they're hurting him and, and, and eventually going to kill him. Okay? But the fact is, you know, God is always going to be with us. And so he's quoting David, but he's making a point with it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, they said, well, this man is calling for Elijah. He's calling, you know, Eloi, Eloi. That's supposed to be Elijah. Anyway, he's going to, Elijah's supposed to come down. This man is calling for Elijah. And straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. Now that's without the gall, okay? Gave him to drink. And the rest of them said, let be, let be, let, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again, now watch, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. It's not that he was so hurt and so tired from everything that he literally, it was exhausted and done. That's not it. Jesus, if he didn't give his life, this is all for naught. He gave his life. Nobody killed him. Nobody murdered him. Nobody took his life. He gave his life. Okay? Let him be in these positions where he's put on this cross and, and going through the whole thing, okay? Nobody kills Jesus, praise God. He is, he's yielding up his ghost. He's, he's letting it go. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, symbolizing that the way is now open to God. You don't have to have a, a priest that's going to be the in-between guy. You don't have to have somebody who's going to get you halfway there once you've got yourself halfway there. No, the, the, the curtain is rent, and you can be right there with God. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, now watch, and many, many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, so now that's after the resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, back to the time span. Verse 54, and when the centurion, that soldier who's responsible for a hundred others, okay, the centurion, when he saw the earthquake and those things that were done, he feared greatly, truly, he said, the centurion, truly, this was the Son of God. Somebody got it. Right? Nobody else gets it. An angel says it. He says it. You know, finally, somebody got it. A Roman centurion. Pagan at heart. <laughs> okay. But now he sees salvation coming from this, this fellow on the cross. Watching Jesus, he saw the earthquake and those things that were done. He feared greatly. Truly, this was the Son of God. Now watch, last two verses. And many women were there beholding afar off, okay, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, you know, Mary Magdalene and, you know, the... Uh, well, it mentions a couple of them here. Look at verse 56. Among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. That would be Salome, the sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay? 
Salome. And she's mentioned more than once in all of this. And she's there. Doing what? Trying to get close to Jesus. Trying to be close to Jesus. You see how it all fits together? This really is one story. Okay? Really, it is one story. Now the question is, where are these people? What, I mean, well, you read where they were, you see where they are. They're nearby, they're calling out for this, they're saying these things. Some are against Jesus and some are not. Praise the Lord. Praise especially for the ones who want to be near him. Okay? So then the question has to be asked, and you'll turn to 315, number 315 in your hymn books, to see what this question is. Were you there? Were you there? On our hearts, dear God, in a very, I believe, real way here today. You have, you have spoken, dear God, of the steps that are taken and that even will need to be taken in these last of days. And we want to thank you, Lord, that we don't have to go running off all scrambled and, and different from where Jesus is going. I want to thank you, dear God, that both John and Peter stayed pretty close. Peter, of course, ended up out in the, out in the courtyard and was um, basically tempted to deny even knowing Jesus. And John was right there in the room with him while he was being tried. So I want to thank you, Lord. Others, All the others, dear God, they ran in different directions and, and ran away from it. But Lord, you're calling us, dear God, to run to you, not away from you. And so we do thank you for what you have spoken here tonight in this place. You've helped us see what the path looks like. You've helped us to see that it's one step in front of the other. You have helped us see, dear God, that even on the cross, Jesus could continue stepping, taking the steps, and he didn't even have to touch the ground with his feet. He's on this cross, and he's still taking steps. Praise the Lord. I think, dear God, back on some of the things we remember that he said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Or he said to Mary, Mary, here's your new son. He said to John, here's your new mother. Take care of each other. One thing after the other, he kept taking steps, even while his feet couldn't touch the ground. And I thank you for that, Lord, because sometimes we feel like our feet aren't touching the ground either. But we know, dear God, if we want to be following you and going your way, that's what you will empower us to do. So we thank you, and we love you, and we thank you for this night, dear God. Speak into our hearts, dear God what it is to truly continue to go your way, step by step, one foot in front of the other, even if those feet can't touch the ground. We thank you, we praise you, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we do thank you, we praise you, we love you, dear God, and you, Lord, will have all of the glory. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. In his name we pray. Amen. Go in God's peace.